Pocket Puncher Show, episode 99, Game Advocates, original D&D. This episode is sponsored by Drive Through RPG. Everybody, welcome back to the Cannon Puncture Show. This is Rich here, and I'm happy to bring you another one of our Game Advocates episodes. On the line with me, I have a blogger from The Mule Abide, and he's been published in Fight On, which is a fanzine. Uh, this is Tavis Allison. How are you doing, Tavis? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I am fantastic. Welcome to the show. Thanks. So, why uh, are you on Game Advocates? What's this uh, game you're interested in? Uh, it's a role-playing game called Dungeons & Dragons. Ah. You might have heard of it. <laughs> I think some of the listeners might have heard of this. There are all kinds of flavors of D&D. Any in particular you want to talk about? I think the, the flavor that I want to talk about is one that is only vaguely reflected by the published text. There's a kind of mythical history of Dungeons & Dragons that, is, that I find fascinating to try to recreate especially since it's been kind of largely lost by everything that's happened since 1974. And so it's a, a source of endless amusement to me to perpetually peel back, like, where you think the things stop being old school. Uh, and I think it, it happens sometimes before D&D is published. So the, the lineage that I find interesting starts with this guy, Dave Wesley, and uh, Wesley and Dave Arneson are part of a gaming, uh, a miniatures gaming group together. And they are in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they're playing like this Prussian Kriegspiel. It was developed by the Prussian Army to train their officers. And these guys are into it because it's so advanced. It's like a, a bookcase worth of books, badly tra- translated from German. And so as they're trying to play this thing, Wesley is, is this super smart kind of guy. So he's reading a guy named Charles Totten, a, an American in the Civil War who's been inspired by this Prussian Kriegspiel. And Totten is interested in multiple uh, objective war games, where it's not, I'm going to defeat you or you're going to defeat me, but rather I've got an objective that's sort of orthogonal to your objective. And Totten also has this idea of a referee, who's going to help make this kind of game happen. And so Wesley gets guys like Arneson together, and they play a game called Brownstein. And in Brownstein, they take on the roles of people who are not necessarily the general of an army, but individual people, some of whom are like a student revolutionary or the mayor of a town. And so Brownstein is this sort of very early experiment in a lot of things that we associate with role-playing, including the idea that for me to win doesn't necessarily mean that, that you are going to be losing. Arneson takes this idea and wants to use it to do fantasy games. And part of why he wants to do fantasy games is that he's realized that the guys who are playing the, the Kriegspiel are, just want to argue. And so he's like, okay, well, this idea of the referee means that the decision-making power and the education can be concentrated in one person. And that person can know the rules, and other people don't have to worry about them because the referee will tell them what happens. But in the Napoleonic things they're doing, people will be like, but no, you know, the powder couldn't possibly shoot that far under these rain conditions according to what the Prussian army had at that time. And so he's like, awesome, we'll play a fantasy game because no one will be able to tell me what a dragon can or can't do. (laughs) And so these two strains of of early D&D the sort of idea that you play a character and that you get, your character has sort of a unique victory condition that doesn't preclude other people's. And then the idea of a a referee who's got this kind of strong power to decide what will happen and to make rulings that are very creative and and tailored for the group and tailored for the situation and that can take into account factors that are much richer than anything you could write ahead of time. So then Arneson goes and he's like, okay, well, we want to have some rules for how we do these fights against dragons. So he looks up a guy named Gary Gygax, uh, who, again, you may have heard of. 
I think I saw him on Futurama once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am roll, roll, roll. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> so one of the things that Gygax has got going on is he's been he's uh, with a guy named Jeff Perrin designed a game called Chainmail, and uh, at GaryCon I played a game of Chainmail that predated D and D. The scenario is the Battle for the Brown Hills, and it's got so many of the things that you associate with the kind of uh, fantasy sort of the roots of D&D and that come from the swords and sorcery stuff that Arnix and Gygax were both reading. But the thing that uh, Chainmail didn't have was that Gary just kind of created these scenarios that were full of awesome sorcerers and battles of, you know, orc armies chasing the forces of law's gold caravan and trying to steal it. But it didn't have a way to make those stories happen at the table. They were just sort of generated by what Gary thought would be a cool thing to play out with miniatures. And so Arneson starts telling Gygax about what he's doing with this Brownstein-inspired kind of fantasy role-playing thing. And Gygax is like, that's totally awesome. Uh, Let's put that, let's use the chainmail situation. Let's put that together. And let's also publish it in a form that will be understandable to people. Uh, One of the things that makes the original D&D so endlessly fascinating to me is that it's a collision between several really different approaches to how you do role-playing. Where Gygax is kind of like the the Paul of of Catholicism. He's like, let's spread the church. Let's make it accessible to people. And Arneson is kind of like, the thing that can be written down is not the true D&D. That, as near as I can tell, Arneson didn't want people to know what was happening behind the screen because he wanted them to engage with things primarily through imagination and then not be not be tempted to reach to the rules layer beyond it. And so the original D&D text has this really interesting tension between here's how you would take this box and you would use it to run a game, the kind of Gygaxian cathedral building, and the sort of Arnesonian mystery of like, it doesn't make any sense. And the awesome thing about that is that it forces you to engage and to try to figure out how am I going to take these very primal fantasy concepts that everybody can sit down and say, we know what we're going to do when we're playing D&D. We're going to go into dungeons. We're going to have elves. How can I take that buy-in to the basic material? And then how can I make the rules accommodate the different perspectives that people have in a super flexible way? Hmm. Uh, And I guess the last people that I want to name check are Bob Bledsaw and Dave Hargraves, who are the first third-party publishers for the early D&D. They very quickly glom onto the promise of the original box set, which is that it's a toolkit that you can use to do your own things. So there's this fantastic explosion of creativity around the possibilities in this new form of gaming. And the, the hallmarks of both of their work are lots of random tables, like anything that you might want to know. Uh, you can look up uh, tables from Bledsaw's uh, in, uh, City State of the Invincible Overlord, and you can learn that you've been pinched by a courtesan in the street or that a robber has emptied a chamber pot over your head. <laughs> and so there's this fantastic kind of improvisational structure that comes out of the early stuff where the the sort of chainmail skeleton of things handles this sort of most basic resolution system. Like if we're going to get into a fight, here's how we're going to dice it out. But then as soon as you fly free of that level of detail, uh, there's a lot of stuff that people generate and that turns out to be pretty easy to do for yourself where you're like, what are the possible things that might happen? And how, what's the table that I'm going to need to generate some really interesting seeds for things to happen, given that I know that this is a city with chamber pots and courtesans? We're talking about original Dungeons and Dragons, which is pretty well out of print. Why wouldn't I just go ahead and pick up 4th edition or, or Pathfinder and play D&D? The thing that a lot of the examples of the particular awesomeness of OD&D uh, that come right to mind come from a 4th edition game that I recently ran. And so the answer is there's no reason that you wouldn't do that, except that the original set is, this, is a very good teacher. And it teaches you different things than a game that, where a lot of the work is done for you. So a, as we're running this fourth edition game, two people roll natural ones in a row. 
And I'm like, okay, well, let's make up a ruling for this. This is an interesting thing that's just happened. The next time somebody else rolls a natural one, the goddess of misfortune is going to pay attention to what's going on here. Sure enough, the next person to roll a natural uh, 20 comes up a one. And so I said, okay, every turn on my turn, I'm going to roll a D6. If that D6 comes up as a one, then something terrible is going to happen. There's nothing in fourth edition that will ever give you the idea of doing that. I mean, you could maybe evolve that principle out of uh, power recharge roll or something. But after you've been playing D uh, original D&D for a while, that kind of like on-the-fly system building is something that you've been trained to do very naturally. Another thing that happened as we were playing is that uh, I was like, okay, we need to get the players to this town. So I'm going to pull out my uh, wandering monster table from od and and I'm going to roll once for the kind of terrain we're in, and I'm going to see that uh, we're in the woods, and a uh, roll of a seven means that there's lycanthropes in these woods. And then I look at that subtable, and I come up with the fact that they're were jackals. And so now just that little bit of random detail is surprising to me because I, I don't know anything about were jackals. What does it mean that there's were jackals in the woods? And it's something that the players can now work with, that because I don't have any preconceived idea of what the were jackals are doing, their ideas are kind of as good as mine. And so when they come into town, they're like, uh, let's buy silver weapons. Let's talk to the villagers about uh, why their, their windows are boarded up against the were jackals. And so the fact that the, those kinds of random tables have been stripped away from later editions of the game, and there's nothing to stop you from doing that, once you pick up that set of skills that the original game teaches you so efficiently, you can bring that to whatever else you're doing. It helps to do it in a, in a system that's very fragmentary uh, because uh, you need to rise above the level of detail that 4th edition or Pathfinder does so well. Where you're like, okay, now that we're in the fight with the lycanthropes, now we're going to worry about where everybody is placed. And you need to be able to rise above that to say... Now we're done with the fight. Here's another wandering en encounter with a Pegasus. And, you know, what does that mean? Where could that Pegasus take us? And you can roll with that because you, anywhere you go, there's probably another random table that you could either pull out of something or generate yourself on the fly that will make you feel like, as a referee, you're not telling the story, you're not dealing with the materials that the characters are presenting, you're exploring the world sort of at the same time that the players do. The dice roll, and you look it up in a table, and you're like, that's crazy. Uh, we're Jaguars. What are we going to do with that? At the same time, the players are like, oh, this is terrible. There's were Jaguars in the woods. How are we going to deal with this? And so the skills that you have as a player of responding to things creatively on the fly are the same skills that you get to bring to being a DM uh, of original Dungeons Dragons or any time that you're using this kind of dice-driven improv, learning what happens next technique. You've touched on it a little bit, but break it down. What are the players actually doing at the table, and what's the subject of the game in action? I think that the one thing to see about original D&D is that it's a gambling game. And ideally, you start that by learning who you are by rolling dice in order. And so you've got your strength, I roll a five. Oh, apparently I'm weak. Uh, I roll my intelligence, I roll my wisdom, my charisma. I go through the set of stats, and it could turn out that my character is really awesome, or it could turn out that my character is extremely handicapped. One thing about it from the perspective of a player is that you are, you are making the best of the situation that you're given, and you're trying to find ways to interpret, even as a player, what the dice are giving you. And so a lot of the game is one of uh, gauging risk. Do we want to go into the dungeon here where there's probably rewards, but there's also likely to be danger? Or uh, is there another way that we could solve this? Maybe we could hang out outside the dungeon and wait for something to leave and then kidnap and question it when the odds are good. And that sense of the unknown is very powerful in that sense that even if you have perfect information there's an awareness that the dice are ultimately going to determine what's going to happen next. And when I, when I play original D&D and early TSR versions of the game, I find that very freeing. I like to know that if I fall into a pit, it won't be because my character is afraid of heights. 
that that pit was just kind of waiting for me. And it would have, uh, if, if the dice had said so, because one cool thing about uh, original D&D pits is that they only open on a one or a two. And so four or five people are going to walk over that trap before the dice uh, say that the pit opens underneath that person. It's very reassuring to me to know that the world is just kind of there and that in some sense it's it's not concerned with my desires as a player and that that can mean that the world is not it's not going to drive towards conflict it's not going to drive towards my issues the way that a game where the mechanics are built around my desires but i i find that relaxing and kind of invigorating to know that uh my the way that i work my will on the on the game reality is solely through the actions of my character and the the kind of decisions that I can make. We average nine new titles a day. That's over 60 a week. And we've got well over 15,000 RPG titles online right now. Drive through RPG, the one true source for RPGs. I think I get what you're you're saying here, and you're already talking about it a little bit, but what else would you warn a new player about? As a new player, I think to understand that the fun is generating a character and seeing what their fate is going to be. And that the, uh, the first time that I played uh, an old edition since I was a kid, I rolled a character who had like a super good uh, constitution score. And I was like, awesome, I'm going to tell a whole story to myself about what this character is, and I, because I've got such a good constitution story, I'm guaranteed to survive. And we, we went a couple rooms in, and he was blinded by a spitting cobra, uh, for which there was no known cure. <laughs> and so it was really like, oh, okay, the fun is going to be rolling up a new character and generating a new story for that guy. And seeing how, like I'd come off a, a, a campaign where it was very much about the stories of our guys and the story of our, uh, the campaign was woven around the personalities of each of the characters involved. And it was kind of refreshing to see that the, this story doesn't care about the fate of my guy who was very awesome, but then was blinded. Like he goes off and retires and the story moves on in another direction. And so I think that as a player, it's good to remember that the, the focus of the action is on, um, a level that's a little bit higher than the, the individual destinies. One of the structures that, that we've developed as a player that's been most interesting is a, a religion that we invented uh, based around one of my characters who was petrified while trying to hold a baby hostage. And then also a, a sort of uh, adventuring group called the Company of Cross Swords. And in some ways, the character building that you would normally do about your PC it can be satisfying to do that that story building at, at a slightly higher level of like an organization that's going to survive the the whatever horrible fate befalls your own character. And there's a lot of latitude to do that because the referee is likely to be generating uh, the content of the world sort of as you go. And so if you're like, oh, well, you know, my character is a cultist of this strange religion – uh, okay, that's that has about as much reality status as anything else that we know about the world. You can sort of seize this narrative power just by suggesting, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this was something that we that we know about what's true? The things that I would say that you'd want to know as a referee are that random events are, are very much your friend. I think the four great random events are, first, a wandering monster check. Like, what is around the hill? What is the the creature that layers here? And then the second check is a reaction roll. Now that we know that there's a, a monster, what do the dice say that it feels about the people that it's encountering? And about a third of the time, it's going to say, awesome, I'm really glad to see you guys. And about a third of the time, it's going to say, you guys are dinner. And uh, the middle third, it's going to be wary and open negotiation. And that was a real aha moment for me because, you know, even if you've got the dungeon mapped out ahead of time, knowing that you're going to have to make sense of those kind of roles on the fly suddenly opens up your understanding of what's going on. Hmm, okay, well, maybe I've got to be prepared for the idea that the goblins are going to make friends with the heroes. Why would they do that? Well, maybe they want him to fight the ogre. Or maybe these unicorns over here, maybe the unicorns are going to attack the players on site. Well, why would they do that? Oh, okay, well, maybe it's because they've been hunted by somebody who came to this dungeon before. 
So the, the reaction rules that, that tell you how the monster responds, and then if combat comes about, the morale rules, so that there's a chance that the monsters will get tired of fighting and decide to run away. Those sequence of things, and I, I guess the fourth one is what treasure the, the monster has. Uh, and so sometimes that turns out to be super surprising, too, that there's this very powerful artifact in the, uh, in the dung of the unicorns. How did that get there? <laughs> Those sequence of roles are this very flexible engine for generating interesting things that, that are going to happen next and that work well with players who've got no previous history with role-playing games at all, except that they sort of know what Dungeons & Dragons is, and the idea of going into a dungeon and meeting a goblin is very vivid and real, and that they're happy to interact with things without a very rule-bound kind of situation, but just, we're going to roll these dice, and, and the DM will tell us an understanding of what's going to happen. There's the possibility to be surprised by what happens, but there's also a lot of possibility to make sense of what happens and to have the sense that you make sort of become the reality of the game. What are some of your favorite moments at the table? The things that are most enjoyable for me are the ones where there's a, a sense of uh, mystery. Part of why I'm drawn to this very early kind of D&D is that the, the illustrations uh, evoke a kind of medieval feel. Uh, you know, the, the amateurishness of the art says, you could do this yourself. Uh, the, the drawings on my character sheet are going to be roughly as good as what was in the 1974 edition. And also that people who drew this didn't have a very advanced understanding perspective. The, the original rules have this ancient feel to them. The original D&D is archaic even at the time that's released. And a, a big part of the this understanding of what we have about D&D is kind of like, we're going to be delving into the ruins of a, a, a forgotten age. A lot of times that turns out to be a post-apocalyptic age, that if you go far enough into the dungeon, you're going to find like a, an old F-15 fighter jet that nobody knows how to repair anymore because the world is so far beyond the world that we know. And so the, the things that, that I get a kick out of most are when we will find a wand of magic missiles and we'll be like, okay, well, magic missiles isn't in the first three books. It's the spell that everybody feels is part of D&D. But now we don't know what it's going to do. Uh, those rules came later, and we sort of narrowed our window to say, we're going to treat the, the 74 text as what's real. And so now we get to reinvent what magic missile does. Okay, well, uh, should it have a to hit roll? Let's decide that what it's going to do is that when you fire the wand, you're going to roll three to hit rolls because we decided it's a seven le seventh level wand. And if each of those is a double or a triple, the wand is going to run out of charges. And then the player's like, well, that's a good idea, but I'm going to make up a D6 table of different ways that it could fail when it's going to fail. And so we had a, a situation recently where the players had gotten into a bathhouse uh, that was built by this sort of ancient Thracian civilization. And they figured out it was a good place to hide from the, the monsters because you had to be human to get into the bathhouse. And it was segregated by gender uh, so that once, one, once men were in the bathhouse, the women couldn't enter and vice versa. <laughs> so they managed to defeat this sort of ancient privacy device and all get themselves into the bathhouse. And then they're holing up, like stripping the valuables off the wall. And when they come out, there's like a horde of minotaurs that know they're in there that have been waiting for them. And also another character one of the things that is fun to do and that this kind of system does well is to introduce people when they just walk up to the table. And so if, if you show up two hours late, awesome. Well, probably you followed the party into the dungeon and you've been invisibly clinging to the ceiling of this cave where you watch the Minotaur set up this ambush. So now this big crazy fight breaks loose and uh, they, uh, they're firing the magic missile wand. It, uh, he finally rolls the triples and tosses it into the center of the Minotaur, and now we get to roll on the table to see what it's going to do. And so it's just this very satisfying payoff of everybody feeling very uh, sort of equally able to, to shape the sense of what's going on, the sense of rediscovery of, of not knowing what a magic missile wand is going to do until you uh, make it up yourself, and then until you roll on the table to see that it's going to, in two rounds, fire off uh, randomly causing great consternation. Cool. Break it down, Tavis. Why do people hate original D&D? So when I ran this 4th edition game at a, at a 
party that was given by an artist here in New York, he contacted a, a meetup group that is devoted to fourth edition. And so it was this very, given my own druthers, I would have run an old school game. And I did have people roll 3d6 in order because I find that for people who don't know how to play, that gives an immediate buy-in. Like when somebody rolled like a three wisdom, everyone at the table is super excited to see how will you play a character that's as foolish as it's possible to be. But then we also had some people who were uh, fourth edition players and who had started with that. And it was very reassuring for her. uh, As I was saying, do we guys want to play with miniatures? She says, I really like to be able to visualize the scene. And I I, I like to use miniatures because I want to count out and know for sure that it's according to the rules that I could get to where I need to go during my round. And so for her, she wanted to be reassured that I knew how to play by this very firm set of structures and that we were all going to be following the rules that I could also count out the squares from my monsters. And once I established that, that there was a reality on that level, uh, then she was ready to be, okay, well now there's a Pegasus in the sky. That's crazy. And now this, now let's all ride the Pegasuses into the sunset. All right, whatever. Because there was this kind of firm reality footing that came from the rules she needed that to be ready to go off in the in the more kind of wahoo flights of fantasy. I think that people people hate the the really old games because it doesn't give you that that rule structure. And I think that people are also used to getting their options about what it's possible to do from the rules. And so uh, when when I sit down to to run new players through a, a original D and D game, I say, okay, the choices that you have for what your character can be. You can be a fighting man, you can be a magic user, you can be a cleric, and these are the ones in the books, or we can make up whatever you want to be. And to do that, you have to get past the mindset that what the designers have done is necessarily better than what you're going to pull out of your butt sitting here at the table. (laughs) You know, the rules are just a framework. The, The original text gives this very awesome sense of, we've just now figured out how to do this cool thing with dice and pretending. And we're going to give you some ideas about how we made it work for us, but it's going to be up to you to take that sense of how it works and make it work for yourself. And so for people who are used to, used to having what you can do defined by what's written on your character sheet, you need to unlearn that way of thinking before you're able to appreciate the thing that original D&D can do well. Ah. So Tavis, anything else you want to talk about original D&D? I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> you told me quite a bit. I love the the history, Tavis. Thanks for for sharing that with me. I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, being a game advocate for original D and D. My pleasure. We had such potential, such promise.